Okay, um, we will take it up from where we left uh, last Thursday. Again, uh, wanting to welcome all of us for today's Bible study. Um, one topic has refused to um, end, uh, but um, it's all good. It's all good. Um, we're still on issues to do with ministry and issues to do with. Um, um, we introduced a dynamic last Thursday, and that is the dynamic of um, fathering, spiritual fathering, where we say that um, that uh, there's something that um, is unique, very peculiar, and um, beautiful when you uh, look at um, spiritual leadership within the context of um, a father and uh, we were just trying to say that um, <clears throat> many other times um, our people will refer to a spiritual leader um, as a preacher and I was saying that um, preaching is a, a very small part of our assignment in actual fact it is the easier part it is the easier part we shouldn't put too much premium on preaching. In, in, in actual fact, let me put it this way. Um, there is a distinct um, difference between uh, preaching and leadership. Okay? You can lead and not necessarily be a preacher. And uh, equally true also, uh, not every um, uh, preacher can... Um, can lead okay it's one of the same thing you know uh, but uh, you get you get you get my sentiment uh leadership is a very different thing because um it requires um, a whole lot of other um qualities um a whole lot of other qualities so uh, and that would require um, for us to look at um the issue of leadership um, uh, very separately uh, totally, let me put it that way, uh, separate from um, a preacher. I, I, I keep coming back to this issue of um, people laying a very heavy emphasis on preaching vis-a-vis uh, -vis, vis -vis, um, leadership, okay? And the other dynamic which you brought out uh, last uh, Thursday, which is spiritual fathering. Again, spiritual fathering and leadership, there are there, there, there are overlaps, and you can see, um, you can you can you can begin to see. Um, in a nutshell, a good leader um, is able to um, is able to mobilize, is able to move, is able to motivate is able to activate, assemble, rally, um, inspire. Um, I'm looking for other adjectives. Uh, people to a certain specified cause. So, so they do all that, you know, you know, they rally, they motivate, they move, they inspire, they... They, they, they do all that, people to a specified goal. So there has to be an element of a shared objective. So the, the, the goal is specific and is shared. And they do all this while maintaining these people's enthusiasm and confidence. Okay? So that ability to move, to motivate, to rally, to activate, to assemble, and I gave a few others, um, people to a common goal, a shared objective, an agreed position, uh, an agreed end, while maintaining their enthusiasm. They, they, they don't feel like they are being dragged, or they are being forced, or they are being coerced, or they are being pushed, or they are, uh, they are under duress or obligation or duty, it's out of delight, it's out of wanting to get to that particular point or place, which is a shared 
you know, objective, a shared end, and they do that, you know, enthusiastically, okay? You know, enthusiastically and, um, and confidently. So uh, let's see if we can wrap up with the issue of fatherhood because, uh, and this is important because what we are dealing with today, and anybody will tell you, I think if we want to be honest with ourselves, um, the biggest challenge of Christian leadership today is that um, there has been massive excesses, um, massive excesses. I'm looking for a way to say that. Um, you you have you have this very narcissistic. Let's call it that way. Um, very narcissistic. Um, attitude that has crept in um, people that are always needing to be superior. That's very narcissistic. Um, high control, exploitative, um, very low empathy, very low empathy. We see that all the time. Very low empathy. Um, Needing to, how, how, how can I put it? Uh, needing to be superior, okay? I don't, I don't know if I, I mentioned that earlier. But the point is made, you know, so, so you have this low empathy, high control, manipulative, exploitative, needing to be superior, people who um, keep, you know, they, 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 um, I'm looking for a good way to say this. Um, um, they have what you may call an alternate reality, which they come up with as they move on. In, in other words, very difficult to uh, please because to please them, it's like it's like a moving target. It's like um, it's like um, you need to do this. When you do that, then uh, then then uh, you need to do this, um, and and uh, when you do that, um, so so people are always you know trying to uh, um, achieve, attain, acquire, hit a target that is essentially a moving target, and you find a lot of disillusionment, you find a lot of um, uh, very unhappy people. Uh, people who are confused, they're, they're not even aware. Well, what exactly do we need? I, I got saved a long time ago. Okay, that's a long time ago. Um, and um, after something like about five or so years, I started getting this feeling like um, there was no getting it right, to use a term. It's, it's like either I wasn't praying hard enough or I wasn't fasting well enough. I wasn't reading the Bible well. I wasn't living right. I wasn't talking right. I wasn't, uh, I didn't have faith. There was always this defect thing. Anytime I went to the house of God, I came out feeling guilty. I came out feeling deficient and defective. It's like there was something structurally defective about my person. And I thought it was me until I began talking to people and I realized this was a corporate sense of disaffection. Um, many people um, had uh, that feeling, but they were unable to put a, a word or a phrase to it. Uh, and I began to get very frustrated because um, I kept feeling that um, there was no pleasing this God. And there was no, um, the goal was, was very elusive. There was really a happy moment when I prayed, uh, uh, um, as, as we did uh, quite a lot uh, then. Um, it's there was something we were missing in our prayer. Uh, when we fasted, there was a dynamic that, and, and, and there was this thing which was what I'm calling an alternate reality. It's like trying to, um, it's like you're trying to uh, attain. Um, it's, it's, it's like this thing keeps moving. I think that's a better way to say it without having to uh, use too many other words. And so I needed to settle down. 
And like I'm sure some of you have done at a very personal level and define my own spiritual work. Um, and that took me time. I needed to settle down and say, hey, what's with this God? The way God was, um, was um, uh, brought out to me those early days, he, he, he seemed this um, insatiable. Um, you never satisfied him. Um, there was always messages were always very punishing. It was like being whipped. Um, you, you, you didn't do this. You, you, you don't talk right. You, 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 you talk too much. You talk, maybe if you're not talking too much, maybe you're talking too little. You, um, you know, and you're maybe you're spiritual, maybe you're not spiritual. And, 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 and it became a quite um, a situation for me. Um, thankfully, by God's grace, I think um, I managed to get some sense of anchorage, some sense of uh, um, um, a foundation, and I began to appreciate to understand God in a in a in a much more better way. Um, uh, let me say this: if we don't introduce this aspect of spiritual fathering. And all we have are people who believe that their duty, their job, their aim every other time they mount a pulpit is to preach a gospel, to, sorry, not to preach a gospel, to preach a message. The probabilities are that people will constantly keep on feeling like uh, they are defective. And I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why. Um, The, the, the kind of message that tickles a lot of us is a kind of message that um, um, is a kind of message which comes with an element of um, um, there's something that you are yet to uh, allow me to develop this. Maybe I'll, I'll get better words as we move along. But, but, but the kind of sermons, the kind of messages that, you know, when, when a man of God leaves a pulpit and he says uh, that was a great, you know, preaching, it's when people feel like uh, they are deficient and so he has introduced something and uh, now we need this thing and if we get this thing, then we are good to go. And, and so there was, there's always that need to keep on creating um, um, uh, something out there, something in the sky somewhere uh, that uh, you're not doing well. It, it's prayer, you know, reading the Bible. It is, it is. And most of the time, it's not even very friendly. Granted, and please understand where I'm coming from. It is true. There are times we need to improve and adjust and uh, be better and tweak something and and add something. It is true. But 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 this should not happen in an environment of condemnation. This should not happen in an environment of a very friendless. It's like uh, if I did five things right, I mean, God only sees this one thing which I did wrong. I mean, it's, 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 it should never be that way. There, there has to be a sense in which people relate. Um, uh, you know, I mean, think about it. I mean, uh, a few of us here are, are, are parents and... Uh, I mean, you know, you know, you know clearly there are so many things that um, your children can do better. But there are also so many other things which they have done fairly well. Uh, I don't think we come hammer and tongs on them, you know, on those issues which uh, they need to improve on um, without even acknowledging that, um, I mean, you've done extremely well on this issue. And uh, that other issue which I asked you to do, you, you know, you've also been able to, um, do it pretty well and, and and so we affirm them even when we rebuke them we kind of sandwich the rebuke between affirmation and then the rebuke and then more affirmation because nobody wants to feel like if they are never getting it okay that um, your best will never be enough and, and that's a kind of feeling and I'm trying to kind of get the proper words to say this that's a kind of feeling I got uh, 30 something years ago and um, I had to really settle down and say I mean really there's not satisfying this God Th then I read the scriptures and I realized no 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 
uh, God has uh, worked with people with clear, obvious um, uh, challenges and weaknesses, some of them even character weaknesses. And uh, God has uh, given these people you know, the time and the opportunity and he'd been patient with them. And uh, these people have, um, you know, you know, eventually, you know, overcome some of those excesses, you know, um, without necessarily having to come so heavy on them. Uh, I mean, look at somebody like Peter. I mean, Peter had his own issues. And, and I think Jesus did, you know, overlook a lot of things about Peter. And that's only one example. I mean, you can just talk about any other person in scripture. Um, and you can see this father, because we talk about fatherhood, very caring, very patient. Of course, God wants us to, 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 to do things right. Of course, God has a standard which he wants us to meet. But also God is not oblivious. God is not um, unaware of um, our efforts and our push and uh, all those things which we do to try and um, attain those objectives. And so for me, it gave me peace. I think I realized that um, I, I had a God who was understanding that I could uh, I could go to him and, and um, as long as I wasn't living in rebellion, you know, as long as I was struggling to become better, I, I, I believed and I still believed that God was quite um, and still is uh, quite understanding. So I, I, I still want to, to, to build further from what we talked about. I think the last point where we left last uh, Thursday was, um, if I'm not mistaken, I, I didn't listen to the recording uh, when Paul sent it today. Um, I think we left, uh, we left it at Malachi chapter 5. Is it chapter 5 or chapter 4? I can't remember. Uh, the second last verse of the Old Testament where it says, um, um, can I remember how it went? Uh, I may just need to read it from the scriptures. Let me just uh, go right ahead and do this. So this concept that we're introducing, of course, we're not the ones doing this. God has been trying to say this to us for the longest time. I'm in Malachi. Okay. Malachi chapter 4, we'll read verse um, 5. Behold, I will send you Elijah, and Elijah, of course, is a, I'll send you, a, you know, a prophetic um, um, unction um, before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord, which is the last days. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the heart to the cast. And I, and I was saying that we need to kind of fix it there a little more because this is the actual final last verse of, Mal I mean, of Old Testament. So we are assuming that by the time we go to, to, to Matthew, um, that God has introduced this dynamic this new way of relation of re, of relating um he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers and we said many things last time and i won't repeat them lest i come and i smite the earth with a curse um let me put it this way spiritual fathering is a dynamic that god i think i may just have to Get it straight for my notes. Spiritual fathering is a divine strategy to reform society. That's what you need to write down, you know, on that particular verse of scripture. Because that's what it means. That I want to reform society. Okay. And the way I'm going to do this is that I'm going to introduce this father-son relationship. And if you get it well, if it gels, if it blends, if it if it works seamlessly, and if it is um if it works, if if it if it if it operates as it should, you know, the Bible says, I will not destroy the, 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 the society. So spiritual fathering is a divine strategy, I put in my notes here, to reform society. I began by saying that a lot of the excesses which we see, if we, have, if we just introduced that concept and people embraced that spiritual, you know, dynamic of, I'm not just a preacher who is supposed to come up with a hot sermon. 
make people feel whatever, whatever. Something that um, ends with people saying, wow. Uh, because, because, because uh, there is more to preaching, to, um, you know, there is more to serving God than wowing people with high sounding statements and, um, and um, eloquent, uh, you know, there is more to this. And, and I really want us to start looking down on this. It's not as important as sometimes we have placed it. It's somewhere down there, you know, you know, on that food chain. It's not up there. It's down there, far down there. Okay. Let me also add this other point. So my first number, my, my number one point is that spiritual fathering is a divine strategy to reform society. You introduce the father concept, trust you me, trust you me. I mean, did you hear the president yesterday? And I think I can quote him. And I saw some statistics which have been sent on our WhatsApp group. The president was actually yesterday concerned that I think Kenya is leading in a single motherhood, something like that. Either in Africa or some 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 you know statistics. And the president actually said that this is dangerous. The world over, either you go to the US, you go to Europe, you go to the prisons, you talk to those people there, and you will find that the issue of fatherhood has played a role to why people have completely missed it. And society seems to become, um, you know, uh, what can I put it? How can I say? Society decays at the very core when the place, the space, the responsibility, uh, the position of fathers is not properly embraced. And we know it. We know it. I, if you wish to do this, you can check this one out. Check American prisons. Okay? And look at, um, because they, they keep very good data, how many of those people are operating from a defective fatherhood, father-son relationship? you probably are going to come up with it. And 70, 70 can also be a very conservative figure. It can be 80 or 90. Because there's something about fatherhood that you can never gainsay. You can never run away from. Spiritually is the same. What we have are preachers. And I told you, and I repeat for the upteenth time, preachers are just that people who go grab a salmon, you know, they, they want it to be exciting. They, it's very sentimental. Um, I don't put too much premium on this. In fact, in my 30-something years, almost 40 years of Christian, you know, life, I have found people who can make amazing proclamations on stage, who don't inwardly practice those things which they say. I don't know what I'm saying. People making powerful declarations and proclamations, and inwardly they live in rebellion on those same issues. This is chicken feed. This is the this when I mean chicken feed, this is cheap. Preaching is cheap. Leadership. I mean, Paul tells Timothy, Timothy, I'm a father to you. Okay, that's why Paul never addressed Timothy as Timothy without calling him my son Timothy. I'm a father to you. It means I'm concerned not only about your pulpit ministry. I'm concerned about you as a person, as a human being. Okay, as a person. And I have gone all the way back and traced your spiritual footprints from your grandmother. That's what we're reading the other time. And your mother. And he says, and I'm convinced that same faith is in you. All I'm trying to say is that this is not some cursory, casual, random guy that you've run, you know, into. And all of a sudden now we are saying, you know, let's do this thing. This is Elijah, Elisha. These are years of very close spiritual walk. By the time the man says, ask what you want, I want your an anointing. And the man is saying, look, you've asked a hard 
thing. That scripture, you've asked a hard thing. You don't give an inheritance to a stranger. You know, it, there has to be vital connection. Okay? In natural life, blood connection for there to be an inheritance. So, uh, not to believe at the point, spiritual fathering, um, it's the divine strategy that God wants to use to reform society. And again, uh, please forgive me for having to be myself. I want you to study what lack of proper fathering has done. Okay? In society, generally, in a natural sense, then translate that spiritually because it's the same. All truth is parallel. All truth is parallel. So if, if, it is, if it is that bad in the natural, trust you me, it is equally very bad. in the spiritual and that's a person who can preach to us one a person who can who we can cry on their shoulder who can be there when the business is not doing well and uh, and, and 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 not just offer prayer and prayer is good but even be there as a person in your morning and 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 when your child is running some some temperature at night and 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 you're able to say, hey, look, I mean, I'm here, I'm going through this, I'm depressed, I'm having issues with my with my wife. And 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 they will not just give you high sounding spiritual statements, but they're able to walk with you patiently on issues. It's called fathering. Number two, that spiritual fathering is the extension of the fatherhood of God in a tangible way. Let me say that again. Spiritual fathering is the extension of the fatherhood of God. So basically the model is God. So you have to study God and how he, because it's called our, our father who art in heaven. So you have to study how God relates with us. Okay, from the Bible. Spiritual fathering is the extension of the fatherhood of God in a tangible. So now God, of course, is spiritual. Now we are bringing this in a tangible way. You, you, you can feel the love. You can feel the warmth. You can feel the hospitality. You can feel the concern. You can see the care. You can, you can feel the touch. You can feel the touch. Okay. When you're aching, when you're happy, when things are running, you know, you know, helter skelter, the the leadership, the father is there. Sometimes not even having all solutions, but sometimes just being there saying, Bro, I'm just here to be with you. Okay. In times of weakness, and, and, and this is so there's a certain camaraderie, there's a certain um togetherness that is beyond this is a guy who gives me great servants okay oh, oh, I mean, i'm sure by now you know i don't put too much premium on, on sermons trust you me okay i guess because i've preached so many sermons over the years that i've done thousands and thousands and thousands of sermons and i've come to realize how easy it is if you know how to do this and you're a bit of experience someone is you can do extremely well and mean nothing okay Spiritual fathering number two, this is what I said, is the extension of the fatherhood of God in a tangible way. And this is done to reproduce the spirit of sonship in the saints. Now, when we have time, and I believe God will give us the opportunity, we'll talk about the spirit of sonship. Because it is one thing for God to be the father that he is to us. It's another thing to be a son. You, you, you understand? Um... um, um Paul wanted to travel with Timothy. Paul was playing the role of a spiritual father to Timothy. And then Paul realized that Timothy will have a challenge, you know, in ministry, um, traveling with him because Timothy came from a Greek father and Timothy was not physically circumcised. The Bible says that Paul circumcised him. Okay, so sonship means surrender. By the time somebody undresses, and dresses before another, okay? It means there's nothing they're holding back. So we will have time, we'll talk about this. And that's just a, a sneak peek into sonship, okay? You know, you know, you know, you know, you know it's, there's, there's, there's something there. There's something there. There's something there. 
Okay, so let, let us put it this way, that the nature of spiritual fathering derives its blueprint from the fatherhood of God. Okay, people should not come up with their own, uh, let me give you some, uh, I don't know we are recording and this will go very far. Some time back, uh, we had this issue of people calling, you know, you know, you know others fathers. And um, it was extremely abused. And you know it, I mean, we've been around this band for a very long time. It was heavily abused. Um, what it meant is that um, you're supposed to go to this person's house, you're supposed to clean their clothes, if they have children, you're supposed to, I mean, and it became such a massive abuse, okay? I think it's toned down a little bit now, but it was a, it was, it was one of the most abused thing. Um, people were made to do things which you wouldn't even, you wouldn't even do to somebody you're paying. And of course, they did that without even a pay. Um, I know people who completely walked away from salvation because the, the abuse was just on another level. That's not what it is. It's not having somebody who is acting as a pet, okay? Like a pet, like, a, like, like my dogs here. You know, I've got a couple of dogs here, okay? Or somebody acting like a slave. No, 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 no. No, that's, that's not the thing. And I remember we began saying, you know, how long those things were. And everybody was saying, you know, this is how you get your anointing. This is how you get, you tap into this. No, no, no. That's, 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 that's abuse. By any other name, that, that's abuse. So um, the nature of spiritual fathering, I want to repeat this, derives its blueprint from the fatherhood of God. All spiritual fathering stems out of the revelation of the fatherhood of God. First Corinthians 11, 1 says what? Paul speaking, imitate me as I imitate Christ. That's the only way. Imitate me. So in other words, let's put it this way. If I stop imitating Christ, if I stop being humble, if I stop being caring and loving, Jesus says I'm the good shepherd. I take care of my sheep. I go ahead of the sheep. The sheep follow me willingly. If I stop imitating Christ, then sever that relationship immediately with that person. I repeat, you are only mandated, I don't think that's a good word, but you are only permitted to follow a person in the name of a fatherhood son relationship, um, of, a, of a father son relationship, if that person remain connected to the fatherhood of God. And the, and the same can be said, I think I can get this very quickly. There's something that sometimes people miss uh, when we're dealing with um, Elijah, Elisha. Elijah, Elisha is found in uh, 2 Kings. Okay, let's see if we can get there quickly. 2 Kings chapter 2. Let me give, let me give you some revelation here. This so it came to pass, the Lord would take up Elijah, I mean, verse 1, uh, into heaven by a whirlwind that Elijah went to Elisha from Gilgal. And Elijah said unto Elisha, Tarry here, I pray thee. Uh, the Lord has sent me to Bethel. And Elisha said unto him, Listen, 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 because this is repeated like four times. Elisha said to him, and I repeat, this is repeated by Elisha four times. As the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. So they went down to Bethel. Do you see this dynamic where he's saying, the Lord, as long as the Lord lives in you, and I'm paraphrasing, as long as your soul is connected to God, and I would like you to use different versions, then I'm not going to leave you. As long as the Lord lives, and as long as your soul lives, your soul must be alive in God. I will not let you go. The moment that connection, you know, is affected in whatever way, I walk, I walk, I walk. I am grateful for the time we had, but I walk because you cease being that vine, I don't know if I can call that vine, you, you see it's been that conduit, you, you, the supply is cut. 
So he said that, you know, in respect to God has sent me to Bethel. And then uh, if you read on down there, he says the Lord has sent me to Jericho. And he said, as the Lord liveth and as I so liveth. No? So he goes down there that the Lord had sent him to the Jordan. And then he says the same thing. As the Lord liveth, as I so liveth. So all I'm trying to say here is, you only follow a person spiritually. You only drink from that vine, for lack of a better word, as long as that vine is connected. Okay, let's call it a branch. You only, you only partake of that branch as long as it's connected to the stem. That's the only way. That's the only way. We, we, we have to avoid being, um, and, I, and I had somebody say something very interesting one time. He said, there's a difference between being attached and being connected. And he says, a tick, T-I-C-K, eh? tick, eh? a parasite, tick. A tick is attached to an animal. And you've seen it, even sometimes the animal dies. And the tick is still attached. I have no idea the animal has died. Okay. So attachment is different from connection. Okay? So we are not attached. We're supposed to be connected. We're supposed to be fused. Okay? The moment that person loses their connection with God, walk. Walk. Just 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 walk. Walk. It's 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 time up. It's time up. Just walk. Okay? Um People start behaving weird. They start becoming manipulative and exploitative and controlling and dominating. And, um, you know, and uh, they abuse your, your individual right. And, you know, you just walk. Because that's, that's not how God does it. I mean, God would save all of us in a flash, but God allows us to do this willingly. So this idea of people being pushed and forced into things, you know, in the name that God told me, you know, these things have to end. So let me let, 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 let me let me let me just uh, try and you know end that second point there. So we must first experience the fatherhood of God. I'm on the second point. We must first experience the fatherhood of God in impart this dimension through our relationship. That's what we tend to say in so many words. We cannot father others properly if we have not been fathered ourselves by God the Father. It's, it's, then what's the template? We're using what template? We're using what blueprint? Okay? The moment you go this direction, people, something will change fundamentally in Christian leadership. And we will stop having these, you know, personalities who are larger than life and superstars and, and um, know it all. And uh, people see them and they start scampering and running. And, uh, you know, people carry their books and people, and they have this, aura that is beyond a human being and what you're going to have are servants men and women whom we respect but not lords and small gods or replacement chiefs no, no. we're going to have people that we can relate with so we cannot fathers we cannot sorry we cannot father and uh, we cannot father others properly if we have not been fathered ourselves by god the father. Let's do three more before we bring this to a close. A good father talks to his son's potentials. But a, I don't want to call him a father, but okay, maybe you can use uh, the same word. Let's say a dysfunctional father reacts to his own faults in his sons. No, you, you need to hear that again. So a good father talks to his son's potential. They, 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 
they look at this person and you see it in the Bible, Jacob, Isaac, all these people, they will look into their children and they're going to say, you're going to do this. I see this ahead of you. And, and they speak to their potential. They enlighten them. They affirm them. They, you know, they keep on them. Um, uh, what's the one? Um, they, they they recast that vision constantly so they, they, it's, it's refreshed in their minds constantly. A good father talks to his son's potentials, but a dysfunctional father reacts to his own faults, the same things which are his fault. Uh, there's a Kikui song, I, it's, it's not a, exactly a Christian song, um, but um, it's a very interesting song. Very, very nice song. I, I listen to uh, vernacular quite a bit, uh, stations. And in this song, the guy is telling the father, uh, it's a very nice song. Uh, he says, the father, look, um, why are you constantly accusing us, you know, him and his siblings, that we don't bring you, you know, big shopping, like... Um, you know, our neighbor, so he mentioned the name. Um, it's, it's in a song. He says, the, our neighbor, the father educated them. Um, the father sold the cow, that's what the song says. The father sold the cow to take them to school. You were drinking. You were philandering. You are, you know, having little other, you know, um, you know, um, uh, marriages out there. Um, and so we we never and the song says that we are supposed to give, bring shopping to you with what we also don't have because you didn't invest in us. So it's I, I just like that that thinking that stop asking us to be what we are unable to do because our 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 deficiency it's because you did not input in us. This, you know, just a nice vernacular song. So a good father talks to his son's potentials. But a bad father, a dysfunctional father, an insecure father, reacts to his own faults. So they normally say that the child you punish most is the one who resembles you more. Because we punish the very thing which we struggle with when we see it in somebody else. In psychology, they call it projection. Okay? You, you project the things which are affecting us, we project them in other people. So a good father, and I say this as I move to the next point, talks to his son's potentials that a dysfunctional father reacts to his own faults in his sons. Let's take, let's take uh, two more uh, very quickly. What time is it? Okay, I think we can take two more. Spiritual fathering is supposed to establish self-government. Now, again, this is where you see clearly we don't need to put too much premium on preaching. The idea is not just to excite and tickle people's fancy with, like I said earlier, nice, high-sounding, you know, you know, sounds. The issue is to make this sons, um, self-reliant. Self-government means self-reliant. So yesterday, we were celebrating, you know, Madaraka. It simply means we began to take care, to rule ourselves, to take care of our business. Okay? We started the journey of freeing ourselves from the shackles of colonialism. Okay, spiritual fathering is about freeing these people, of course, having, having equipped them, freeing them so that they are not constantly, perpetually relying on you. That if I'm not there, people don't get blessed. The service can't go on. Um... There's a marked difference in the spiritual arena, you know, with its charge of, you know, Bible study. No, 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 no. It's, it's, it's people are supposed to be made um, to become 
self-reliance so that I don't need um, to surveil Hayes, for example, my good friend Hayes. I don't need to surveil Misiga. I don't need to surveil um, Chris. You know, surveillance like you're, you're, you're tagging somebody and surveilling them. No, no, no. I don't need to go following to see. I have inputted in them what it takes, the we are we for to stand on their feet, to go fetch for their own bread, in quote, spiritual speaking, to be able to stand on their feet, fend for themselves, fight their battles, keep those victories, mark their ground, build from where we, you know, that spiritual fathering, it's not supposed to be, to, we're not about followership. And I think this is a mistake. So today, uh, if you're talking about who is doing very well in ministry, we'll be talking about followership. And, and, and that is really, really, really sick. It's really, really sick. It's, uh, and, and please forgive my language. It's, it's, it's so warped. It's about followership. It's about the quality of the person you produce. Can they stand on their own? When they go out there and speak, okay, if I interact and I just saw Agre, you know, came in, if I interact with Agre for five years, for example, or for two years, there should be a measurable, measurable growth. And it should begin to show by everything about him when he speaks. You know, the Bible says when the disciples of Jesus went out, that the people took note quickly. They took note. This man had been with Jesus. Why? Because this man was speaking different. These people had a certain wisdom, insight, penetration on issues. It's not followership. It's not, it's not, it's not, it's not, it's not about people who, you know, are following blindly, who are deficient and um, they can't, um, when they start to speak, I mean, even our own children here, when we raise our children, we want them to be able to hold their own, hold their own, that they can go to the job where they go and hold their own, speak up and speak out and uh, and be able to impress all by themselves. All by themselves. Okay? So spiritual fathering is to establish self-government. Sons are taught how to police their own lives. Take care of yourself. Fight your battles. Police your life. How to stand up for their convictions. And rights, spiritual rights. How to fight for their own bread. How to fight their battles in life so that they are totally, they are not, sorry, they are not totally dependent on the leader. That when the leader is not there, um, I think my wife told me this, I uh, can't remember, uh, but somebody told me this. So, so this, uh, you know, um, a man of God who, was supposed to be in a certain place. Uh, I think it was a cash or something. And then there was an announcement that was made that the person was not able to, would not be able to make it. And literally from a packed to the brim, <laughs> she drove up, including upstairs. The whole place was left vacant. That tells you something. That, that, that tells you something. One of the ways, and I say this uh, in passing because it is important that I say this, one of the ways of telling that uh, something has morphed, evolved, progressed to a cult is when there is personal or personality worship. There are many ways of telling a cult, but that one is top of the pile. When a man's word becomes low, becomes it, then all your red flags should begin, you know. That's a major red flag. 
that fact that that that's that's not even a flag that is a banner okay huge banner people just walked out and left completely so they were there for what they were there for prayer they were there for cash what were they for okay and that is indictive huh? is that what they call it it's an indictment of spiritual maturity Let's 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 bring this to a close. Self-government is the ability, and this is what we're trying to say with the, the you know the issue of self-government in sense. Self-government is the ability to rule one's life well until you become a blessing and an example for others. That, that, that's what it's supposed to be. Self-government simply means you're able to rule your own life, you're able to fend for yourself, stand on your feet and 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 do your thing. And um until you become a blessing to somebody else and an example to others. It is the ability to find our own resources in God. And that is very important. This Bible study um, has never been for, you know, um, 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 finding out how great, how powerful, what a great teacher somebody is. No, no, no. It's about how can we all collectively, okay, be able to find our own resources in God. So that peradventure, for whatever reason, if I'm not around or for some reason it's, the Bible study is no longer there, then nobody is going to wither away spiritually. People will find their own resources in God. You know? Self-government also I like that word responsibility. Um, Self-government also establishes a sense of responsibility for our own lives and opens a new level in our relationship with God and his people. I think I'm going to stop there. It's, it's uh, you know, 10 minutes to, to 10 and uh, just allow you to go through that. I will give another one, two, three, four uh, when we meet next um, Thursday, God willing, so that at least we can have this nice and tidy, you know. Because again, like I mentioned, I I want us to move away from this um, mob, you know, followership kind of thinking um, that somebody is doing extremely well because they uh, no 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 no. There's, there's a very good verse in the Bible, uh, Proverbs 30, 30. It says um, there are three things that go well. Then it says the lion that does not turn from any, the mountain goat, the, the mountain goat, the hunting dog. Okay. Okay. So there are three things that go well. There are three things that go well. Ye four that are stately in their match, they're elegant. So there are three things that go well. Ye four that are stately in their match. So the lamb that does not turn from any, the mountain goat, a hunting dog, and a king surrounded by his army. Just think about it for a moment. Just let's take two minutes. On that last bit. A king surrounded by his army. Not a king walking, you know, on the street. Not a king surrounded by a population of peasants, hungry, belly protruding, holding a bowl. Our African presidents, some of them, not all, when they travel abroad, they don't get respect. Because it doesn't matter if you're leading 100 million people. If those people are deficient, are hungry, corruption is rife. Hunger is imminent. Disease and sickness. People fall like flies. Nobody looks at you and looks at that you have, that you have 100 million people that you're leading. Okay? You become a pariah out there. But there's something about raising a population of an army. Who is an army? Let me, see, let me see if I can do this on top of my head. An army, it's a group of people 
that are number one, trained. Trained. Number two, equipped. Number three, activated. Activated means they have been released. So we don't even use the word employ when you're talking about the army, when they're fighting, we say they are deployed. They have been released. They have been activated. Go do your thing. You own, you're on your own. Handle this thing based on your training. Based on your training. Based on your training. Okay? I, 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 I like this line a lot. It's, a, it's an area of interest for me. And I can tell you, I can tell you, they, there are people out there, they... They, they, they look small, some of them maybe it's even a female and and uh, I mean I, I, I used to see this when I was growing up because I grew up you know in a, you know uh, uh, in, a, in an interesting way and then you'll find somebody who will uh, you know try to mess around with somebody because they're they small bodied and, and all that. And what this person forgets is that this person is trained trained equipped and activate it. And what happens in a fraction of a minute, it's, it's amazing. They can hold their own. They can hold their own. They can hold their own. Uh, I think we're talking this with my wife yesterday. Um, I take walks every day and I normally walk very lonely parts. And I was telling her how, how somebody followed me the other day. And I really don't, you know, get too scared about, uh, you know, you know, physical confrontation. And um, and um, I, was, I was telling her that this person kind of waited for me to be in a fairly, you know, you know, you know, lonely path. And then I stopped and I waited for them and I said, you're following me. And, uh, you know, what is it that you want? And he said, you know, give me some money. I said, I don't have any money. And then they stood and said, okay, what are you going to do about it? I don't have any money. And you can't follow me. I, I, I know that I can hold my own, okay? If I wasn't, I probably wouldn't walk those parts which I walk. I'm trying to say that, um, that um, an army is trained, an army is equipped. Do we train people? Can we call preaching a training? Do you know? His, um, does... Um, training. There's a time I think we did one or two things with him because I also, you know, do quite a bit of that. And when you when you when you bring people into a place and you're training them, let's say you're training them on customer service or you're training people on um, personal enhancement. So it's a motivation. Or you're training people on uh, team building or, or whatever it is you're training people. Um, it is thorough. It is structured. It's not shouting. It is scheduled properly. It is systematic. It's done well. Okay? It is drilled. It is imprinted in people. You, you don't rush through it. It's not supposed to be exciting. It's supposed to be instructive. These are lessons. And that's how preaching should be. It should be a training. Okay? So we train people, not just preach to people about fasting or praying. It's we train people to pray, to read the Bible. We go to the nuts and bolts, as they call them, of things, the real issues. Then equip people, give them the tools, then activate them. Great, my time is really up. Uh, thank you, thank you, good people. And um, appreciate it again, as always.